the faculty and the star instructors apart from me are i will be taking you through the pre operative planning and workup of phakic lens then dr rama uh, partha biswas on the left it's not uh, coming on the screen it's going out of screen can you realign this yeah thank you dr partha biswas you all know him well he is the champion here today and uh, the ma master scientific program uh, which he has created and crafted i really appreciate and he will be taking us through the correct way to do icl and toric icl then dr ramamurthy will be taking us and uh, fake kiols the indian fake kiols his experience then dr shri ganesh will be with us soon and uh, he will be taking us the lenses fake lenses in challenging situations and how to come out of this how to overcome the challenging situation and then dr sudhank bharti will be taking us and we'll be discussing on the managing complications and pearls to avoid in fake lens so this is in the nutshell and all the faculty all the instructors are very very experienced they have a long track record they have an experience of almost 20 years of doing uh, fake lens i myself have uh, an experience of almost 18 to 19 years we started our journey with the a uh, very size fake lens which was a pmma lens which was placed in the anterior chamber so coming to the pre operative planning and workup of fake lens i don't have any financial interest fake iol we all know and uh, is an intraocular lens placed inside the eye in front of the patient's natural lens to correct the refractive error these are available in three types as per their site angle supported iris fixated p uh, fake lens and uh, the posterior chamber fake lens this post posterior chamber fake lens are the most popular and effective mode of correcting the myopia and uh, hyperopia at present and we will be focusing our course on this type of fake lens only so before taking you further there is a 45 second uh, video of uh, the star Vision ICL. This comes in a bottle in a BSS solution, and uh, with the soft tip plunger, you take it out from the uh, bottle and place it in the cartridge. Load it. This is a front front loading system, and inject it in the eye. You I use viscoelastic. Some people don't use viscoelastic in the eye, but the recommendation from the company and I will also suggest is if you are going to start. then use viscoelastic in the eye and this is a toric lens and you align it with the axis and it doesn't take much time less than the time we take for the phaco emulsification and the results are very gratifying so with this the history there were uh, the quest for the phaco lens began in since 1953 and various kind of lenses have been designed used in last uh, i mean uh, almost uh, uh, 60 70 years this is uh, these are the available lenses and th this lens uh, took us uh, this iris fixated very size fake lens which we all uh, uh, the faculty have used in the past and this was some 10 years 12 years back we used to use but they had they were iris enclavated lenses and in the anterior chamber so chances of damage to the the endothelium and disenclavation and uh, the development of cataract all these were there with this so, and this has come in the form of foldable il also later on as a very flex lens then uh, almost 8 years back uh, acrisof came out with a cache lens but uh, this also didn't pick up the market and because of the placement of the lens in the anterior chamber so in 1986 i think this was the time when fedorov gave us the idea for this present generation lens which was to be placed behind the uh, uh, behind the iris in the sulcus and uh, this has a uh, this was the prototype of the present generation lens the advantages of posterior chamber fake lens is that it lies behind the iris it is far from the endothelium the chances of endothelial cell loss is very less because damage to the cornea is more unrewarding thing in a young patient 
than development of a cataract. So cataract, we all know we are we can do it. Uh, we are doing it at a periodic age group and all age groups, and we uh, when it is there and uh, we we get a good result and we can come out of it without permanent loss or permanent damage to any structure. But damage to the endothelium is uh, more unrewarding. It gives us an excellent cosmesis. It is close to the nodal points of the eye. Gain in the retinal size images because it is close to the nodal point. And there is a greater effective optical zone at the corneal plane. We get a so field of vision is better and there is the less chance of glare and halo. And the, because it is located in the sulcus, it is a stable location. We can have a toric design and we can correct the cylindrical power also easily and uh, with good results. Easily removable, exchangeable. When the cataract develop, you can remove it and uh, you can explant it. That is the one of the finest part that like the corneal base surgery, you are not making the cornea thin and later on the IL power calculation also is very, very easy. So there is no fixation to the iris tissue. So there is less chance of uh, lens uh, disenclavation and other problems. Does not alter the shape of the cornea or remove the tissue like uh, in any other corneal base problem. The shape of the lens, uh, the, which I will be focusing here on the ICL because I have maximum experience of using this lens only. It is a, an implantable columnar lens. It has a central vault. As you can see, there is a convexity and it, this convexity has to be placed anteriorly. It should match with the convexity of our crystalline lens. So the design is such that the haptics on the either side, they rest in the sulcus and still they are uh, away from the our crystalline lens and the central part as you can see it uh, is uh, aligned or it is uh, uh, matched with the crystalline lens uh, and the design is such that uh, it always remains away from the crystalline lens and therefore the chances of development of cataract is very minimal and uh, this is a plate haptic kind it is a foldable lens it absorbs ultraviolet radiation but the important thing here is that uh, there is a sizing issue which we will be taking into our later slides and it is made up of a columnar material. So advantage of this material is that columnar material is that it attracts a fibronectin. Can I have a pointer? So it attracts a layer of fibronectin on the surface of the lens. This minus this thing what you can see. The, it is prep on the surface of the lens and it repels the present uh, the proteins which are present in the aqueous. So, so this fibronectin layer is not working. So um, it repels the proteins. So there is uh, the lens uh, material remains clear e for a longer time and this is not recognized as a foreign body. So you can compare the bottom slide, this the columnar material is on the left and the silicon is on the right side. The, uh, the columnar material clarity uh, you can make out in this slide. And this therefore there is a maximum light transmission, it's not working, the printer. Uh, molecular size is 100 nanometer, shorter than wavelength of the light, that's why there is a maximum light transmission, better optical performance. Please come on the dais, Dr. Ramamurthy, please, yeah. please come. Better optical performance, excellent transmittance and low refractive uh, pattern, very, very flexible, foldable, small incision, it can go inside the eye and easy to inject and easy to remove and there are less glare and halo issues with these lenses. They are available in, uh, uh, in the spherical power from minus 0 0.5 to uh, minus 18 diopters and with the toric correction of uh, plus 0 0.5 to plus 6 diopters. And in the hyperopic, it is from 0 0.5 to up to uh, plus 10 diopters. And they come in a, uh, a steps of uh, 0.5 diopters, 0.25 diopters from 0.5 diopters to um, up to minus 3 diopters and in a step of 0 0.5, 0 0.5 diopters from minus 3 to minus 18 diopters. And they come in various length sizes, 11.6, which is rarely used and 12.1, 12.6 and 13.2, these are the maximally used lenses, uh, lens sizes. And um, the, it has, uh, the new generation for uh, the lenses has got a Centra Flow ICL. It belongs to the category of ICL V4 family. There is a central opening of 360 microns 
and it is designed to restore the natural aqueous flow into the anterior chamber from behind the lens and the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber and it eliminates therefore it eliminates the risk need for the iridotomies the, the there are two paracentral ports of equal of the same size on either side and these two ports help us to facilitate us, us to uh, equilibrate the aqueous in behind and anteriorly and at the same time it helps us in removing the OVD from behind the lens uh, during the procedure and it provides redundancy if per chance the central opening gets occluded due to the proteins in the anterior chamber um, like in iridocyclitis or anything then there these paracentral ports can act as a redundant ports. So, um, the newer EVO Vision ICL comes with a larger optic diameter uh, which is uh, are from 4.9 now to 6.1 millimeter and uh, from uh, minus 0 0.5 to minus 9 diopters it is 6.1 millimeter and this is gives us better quality of vision and uh, less chances of glare halos when we are driving at night and uh, that is the beauty of this lens and similarly in the toric variety also. Now coming to another counterpart that is the Indian lenses which uh, we all are also e uh, interested into and Dr. Ramamurthy will be taking us uh, along with the journey with, uh, with his experience of Indian lenses. So they come, the good part is they come from minus 1 to up to minus 30 diopters. So you can without uh, doing uh, LASIK or anything uh, you can correct more power and if, uh, and in the hyperopic side it is up to plus one, 15 diopters in a 0.5 diopter steps and you can correct up to plus 10 diopter cylinders of the patient. Uh, the, uh, they come into now they are coming as a multifocality lens uh, in presbyopia for, for the correction of presbyopia with plus 1 to plus 4 diopters of correction of near. So optic diameter is larger than with the ICL that is 6.60 millimeter over length. Overall length is better because it can it comes in a steps of 0.25 millimeter. So this is more accurate and the, you can get uh, you can manipulate the vault in a better way. So vault height which we get is a 1.2 millimeter up to 1.8 millimeter, but this vault height should be uh, depends on the size of the lens and the depth of the anterior chamber and wide to wide diameter. So these are this is a presbyopic lens from the Indian uh, company and it corrects the presbyopia. It is placed in, um, like in any other uh, uh, fake lens in front of the crystalline lens. Um, coming to the workup part which is most important thing it is most of the things are same as we do it in any other refractive case. Age group is 21 and 40, up to 45 years of age which is recommended. We should have a stable refraction. There should be less than 0.5 diopter change in one year, last one year. It is good for the LASIK rejects due to high myopia which could not be corrected by the uh, refractive procedure like SMILE, LASIK, FEMTO-LASIK. If the corneal thickness is less than 500 micron, there is a severe dry eye or some amount of dry eye is there when the pupil size is large or when there is the uh, excessive flat or very steep corneas are there where we cannot do LASIK in such cases we should look for the fake lens and there is no previous ophthalmic surgery which is a relative contraindication because we do now for the uh, treated keratoconus cases and there is no previous ocular pathology like the presence of cataract, glaucoma, uveitis, keratoconus, Fuchs dystrophy or any other corneal pathology. A complete ophthalmological examination is done beforehand, uncorrected visual acuity, best corrected visual acuity, refract, uh, refraction manifest and cycloplegic, slit lamp examination, intraocular pressure, no glaucoma, open angles grade 3 to 4, corneal topography and keratometry has to be done in all these cases. We should not say that uh, topography because we are not uh, doing a cornea based procedure topography should not be done but we request you to do to get the topography done in all these cases endothelial cell count should be more than or equal to 2000 fundus examination especially the peripheral retina should be evaluated in all these cases because there is a high chance of development of detachment if there are precursor lesions in the retinal periphery 
and the two important thing which are different are the measurement of anterior chamber depth which should be more than or equal to 2.8 millimeter better it is for the rd cases it should be more than 3 millimeter which should be the excluding the corneal thickness and second important thing is the uh, the wide to wide distance measurement corneal horizontal wide to wide so anterior chamber depth is that uh, many machines they gave us anterior chamber depth including the corneal thickness so mind it we have to reduce the corneal thickness like iol master and uh, other things and even pentacam if you are not selecting uh, the internal uh, measurement then you will get a thickness uh, of uh, anterior chamber depth including the cornea this should be from the uh, posterior surface of the cornea internal anterior chamber depth white to white measurement is very very important because it varies from patient to patient and our end results are uh, i mean based on the uh, the measurement and the quality of white to white we have measured although it is simple the reliable way is to measure by the caliper and uh, we should uh, counter check it with the help of a ruler but nowadays we are using the bottom one the digital caliper uh, and uh, this is much better and this uh, uh, is uh, more in practice nowadays apart from digital calipers we can measure wide to wide by following uh, by the instrument like orb scan pentacam iol master ubm gives us sulcus to sulcus the internal measurement where the lens is going to be placed but it has not been into in, uh, in practice and it is not popularly used because the availability of ubm is also not there and there is uh, inter uh, the, the changes there by the various operator if they are using it a vernier caliper under microscope can be used and some advanced autorefractometers also give this is the measurement of white to white by the iol master 700 you can get it and it measures it 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 is near to it but not accurate and this is the internal sulcus to sulcus measurement on the right side so how to do it measurement should be done under the microscope and uh, in a higher resolution as you can see here with the digital caliper we are doing in a supine position and from the middle of limbus to the middle of limbus on the other side so this gives us the digital value 11.16 in this particular eye and we should calibrate the caliper before we use it this is uh, important so coming back to the uh, ac depth and use of white to white the accurate pre operative white to white and ac depth measurement is important because uh, it gives us the what type what size of what uh, uh, what size of icl which we are going to use whether it is 12.1 12.6 or 13.2 and uh, the because this icls provide a vault and vault is what it's a distance between the posterior surface of the lens uh, icl and the anterior surface of the crystalline lens so this is what we have to measure and this is what we have to see on the slit lamp and ideal sized icl gives us a vault of 0.25 mm to 0.75 mm that is uh, if you assume the thickness of the cornea to be 500 micron so this should be half the corneal thickness which is uh, 0.25 uh, 250 micron to one and a half times the thickness of the cornea so an undersized icl will increase the risk of anterior subcapsular cataract if it is less than uh, 0.125 mm vault and an oversized icl will push the iris from the periphery uh, anteriorly and there is a chance of closure of the angles which could lead to rise in, in the intraocular pressure so this is what we have to see this is a picture which we have taken from the um, uh, the from the net this is uh, the uh, the green one is the anterior surface of the uh, icl yellow is arrow is the posterior surface and the red arrow is the anterior surface of our natural crystalline lens and the distance between yellow and green red arrow is the vault and this thickness which can be seen on slit lamp it should be compared with the thickness of the cornea and within 2 seconds you can judge it whether post operatively whether your icl is properly placed and the sizing is proper or not and in this particular case it is very less and the lens is resting on the surface of the lens in the periphery as you can see so this patient will develop uh, the uh, cataract in early post operative period so this is the sheet which comes 
and we, um, this is how we assess in this particular case the uh, patient uh, the uh, patient's power is ele minus 11.5 diopters with the one minus 1.5 diopters of cylindrical and uh, axis at 10 degree k1 keratometry, keratometry we are entering anterior chamber depth is 3.22 millimeter which we have measured corneal thickness is uh, 526 micron white to white is 10.70 millimeter and this is the lens which is suggested and which we have checked it it's a because the uh, white to white is 10.7 the lens uh, size is 12.1 millimeter and it is uh, the power of the lens is plus 14.5 to uh, with plus 1.5 di diopters of cylindrical and this will the the expected residual refractive error which is uh, shown over here and the lens serial number also we should see on the uh, day of implantation of the IEL we should check it this is another case like uh, why we didn't do uh, the uh, the uh, refractive procedure lens uh, this uh, cornea based refractive procedure because the corneal thickness is less 487 and, and 483 in the left eye and the power is although low but still I, patient preferred to go for ICL because of the advantages the contrast sensitivity is better the abrasions induced are minimized uh, as compared to the lens based procedure and uh, so that's why patient choose chose the ICL over the um, cornea based refractive procedure. Another case with minus 9 diopters of uh, spherical correction, white to white is 11.80, lens size is 13.2 and this is the residual refractive error. So this is a clear case uh, on the other eye, in the other eye it is 10.5, uh, 10.25 uh, and the corneal thickness is less. So this is no, uh, this cannot be operated by the uh, cornea based procedure, uh, refractive procedure. So we have opted for ICL in this particular case. Another case with the uh, minus 4 diopters of uh, uh, refractive power, but the corneal thickness is, uh, 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 is uh, 479 and 489. That's why we chose this uh, ICL for this particular case. And this is an interesting case, um, minus 7.25 in the right eye with minus 3.50 post uh, C3R post corneal collagen cross-linkage patient of, for the keratoconus one year later we operated because the thickness of the cornea is very low 398 in right eye 437 in left eye so these cases also can be corrected and can be managed easily by this uh, lenses and this is the inter Indian counterpart ICL IPCL from the care group I, mean, I don't have no financial interest and uh, th uh, this uh, sheet comes in a similar way for these patients uh, in uh, also. So at the end, this is the recent uh, data which tells us the eight year outcome of implantation of posterior chamber fake intraocular lens with a central port for moderate to high ametropia. This has come into publication in December 2021 and um, from a Japanese uh, this thing authors. And you can see at um, uh, the most of the patients they achieved 80 percent of 6 by 6 vision which was there at first year uh, till uh, the eighth year almost 80 percent of the uh, vision was there in all these patients and 6 9 vision is almost in uh, in 90 to 95 percent of the eyes so uh, so it is stable and there is a uh, no development of cataract with because of the, the central port and center of flow uh, center of flow design the ch incidence of cataract has also reduced and even if there is a low vault around uh, 250 micron vault is also there that is also uh, we we get a extra edge and we are forgiven because the chances of development of cataract are less so thank you for your patient hearing and uh, very any questions we can take it now or maybe at the end of the session. Is there any Japanese um, I don't have any idea, but um, a star is the only FDA approved lens which is making this and others are from the Indian side. Please. Yeah.
Uh, uh, this comes uh, because this ICL, they um, tell us uh, they tell us to use uh, the their full uh, injector system only, and for, and the front loading system of uh, know, loading I the know, lens. I know, I know, I use it. But uh, uh, but, but uh, I Indian know, lenses, I have not used that. Uh, Indian lenses, they are uh, they are used in the same cartridge, what they are being used for the um, normal intraocular lens, and their incision size is also 2.65 to 2.8 millimeter. The incision size required for ICL is 3 millimeter or more. Yeah, but I have no experience of using with the regular cartridge because they they require a soft tip plunger. Material is different. Uh, the, the, it's made up of columnar material. Your experience is also. Yeah, as far as I see, it's a concern because the injector comes along with it and then custom made for that, it goes in very comfortably with that. I think that it's extremely soft and thin and you do not want any overriding of the plunger onto the optics of the lens which will damage it. So uh, I think we have never tried injecting it to anything else because the injector is always supplied with the ICL. Uh, actually, uh, this uh, part will be taken by Dr. Uh, Partha, but uh, for your uh, this thing, what we do is we put some uh, BSS in the cartridge first and some amount of viscoelastic, OVD is then added to it, so it dilutes and then we place the lens over it and then we fill it with the BSS after that also. So more of BSS and less of, or 50% of BSS and less of um, uh, OVD. There's a small difference in the way we use ICLs in the Indian lenses. As far as ICL is concerned, as Dr. Basin mentioned, you can just use HPMC or a combination of a little bit of saline. But when it comes to Indian lenses, it's better to use just uh, <coughs> saline or uh, an, uh, to avoid using HPMC. Whenever I use HPMC with that, initially I used to get some cuts on the lenses and that's avoided once you load it only with the saline because they seem to work better with that. And as regards, just a small comment, you said that uh, ICLs can be used for any kind of cases, including keratoconus cases, I agree with you. But uh, it should be, you have to make sure these cones are centered cones and the patient has, is having an ah. uh, excellent best character visual equity with glasses. If supposing the patient is, has a decentered cone and requires contact lenses, a hard lens or a row scale lens for the correction, then it's better not to put a ICL in these situations because uh, lenses, are the, the fake lenses at best is just a replacement for uh, glasses and they do not correct the abrasions on the corneal surface. So in case you are putting in fake intraocular lenses in keratoconus or iatrogenic keratectasia cases after they are stabilized, make sure that the patient has a good vision with glasses and does not require contact lenses. And uh, other thing is the measurement of white to white and the anterior chamber depth in post keratoconus size. So anterior chamber depth is also higher in uh, post keratoconus size because of the presence of keratoconus that uh, there is a fall, false uh, increased uh, depth will be there. So uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, this thing, Ramurthy will be speaking in his talk. Uh, Dr. Bharti, you are there. Please come on the dial. Welcome. So, uh, any other question? Or shall we take? Uh, uh, results are same. You have to do PI in these cases, one. And uh, secondly, uh, the in hyperopic cases, the anterior chamber depth, usually you do not get adequate anterior chamber depth. So that's why, but if you have an adequate anterior chamber depth, then it gives a good result. The outcome is good. Not in all cases, in hyperopic cases, because they are without the center of flow. They don't come with the central opening, hyperopic lenses. But the results are equally good. Uh, on dot experience, on dot uh, refractive correction. I don't have any experience. I think Dr. Titial has, and Dr. Ramamurthy has some. Please, if you can add. No, one uh, regarding the hyperopia and the ICLs. I think, uh, you know, it's a bit of a misconception that okay. all hyperopic eyes have small uh, ACDs. I mean, right from uh, uh, Jack Holiday's work, almost 80% of the eyes could end up with a fairly uh, good anterior chamber. And uh, especially laser vision correction doesn't work well 
with the hypopia beyond plus 2, plus 2.5 diopters. Okay. So whenever there is adequate uh, anterior chamber depth, we go ahead and for anything beyond 2.5 diopters, uh, ICLs is my first choice. And it works very well. There's absolutely no need for a PI if the AC depth is quite adequate because uh, there is a need for a PI in all these cases because hypropic lenses do not come with a cent uh, central hole because these lenses are fairly thick in the center and it's uh, difficult to create a hole in the center. And secondly, because the thickness of the optics, they would cause uh, unacceptable aberrations. So all hypropic lenses come without a hole, so you have to make a, do a PI in these cases. As far as presbyopic lenses are concerned, I'm going to be briefly referring to it my, during my talk. They are basically trifocal lenses that are available, and uh, they come from an add of 1.5 to 3.5 diopters. It's uh, uh, distance, intermediate, and near. And STAR has also come up with their version of EDOF uh, lenses. As of now, it's not available in India, but I think it's already available in Europe, and uh, we're looking forward to it becoming available soon. I think it's a, I find that that's again an excellent modality for correction of refractive errors. <coughs> I will request, uh, if uh, we will take up questions at the end. May I may request our star instructor, Dr. Ra D. Ramamurthy, for his talk and his experience on um, Indian lenses. Maybe he doesn't require any introduction. He's the past president of AIOS and uh, uh, and a um, chairman scientific committee uh, of AIUS. He has got multiple centers and long experience of uh, using uh, phacic lenses, ICL, and uh, uh, cataract surgery. He's a phenomenal person. Thank you for being with us. <coughs> thank you, Dr. Basin, for inviting me to this wonderful course, and thank you all for turning up. I'm going to be talking about Indian phacic intraoc lenses, my experience, simply because Dr. Basin asked me to speak about it. I have uh, no financial interest in this particular presentation. Uh, basically, uh, the ICLs have been around from 1988, and they have undergone multiple iterations. Those are the lenses I have been using from 2004. I really love those lenses. It's simply the cost factor because of which we have to do go ahead and use the Indian fake intraoc lenses also. In the last five or six years, we have found that these lenses also quite, quite work quite well. In my practice, the positioning of the uh, star ICLs and the Indian fake intraoc lenses is something like uh, the intraocular lenses that we use, the imported good intraocular lenses, as well as the Indian good intraocular lenses. So basically, it's the cost which uh, determines the choice of the patient. And uh, as far as the comparison between these two lenses are concerned, I think some of the points have already been uh, alluded to. The ICL comes in the range of plus 10 to minus 18 diopters. IPCL has a slightly wider range. And uh, mind you, it's not just IPCL, you also have the biotech lenses, you have the lenses from uh, uh, Apasami. But my personal experience, though I have used a few of them, has been largely with IPCL, so I will confine my talk to this. As far as astigmatism is concerned, you can correct up to about six diopters with ICL, about eight diopters with IPCL. You can also get custom-made lenses of a larger powers. The material is collamer. I think that's a very big advantage as far as ICL is concerned, and that's perhaps the most biocompatible material that's been implanted in the eye. On the other hand, with IPCL, it is hydrophilic acrylic. It used to be a matter of concern to me, but in the last five or six years, I found that uh, these lenses also are fairly stable and quite well accepted by the body. And uh, as far as the holes are concerned, there's a central hole in the ICL and two paracentral holes over here. Previously, it used to be just marks, but nowadays they are holes. And what you find in the IPCL is there are multiple holes. There's one in the center, two in the paraoptic region, and there's some on the flanges. And uh, basically, none of these lenses require a peripheral hydrotomy because the central hole that is there. As far as the supporting pads are concerned, there are four pads in the ICL, six pads in the IPCL, and the manufacturers claim that this gives more stability as far as these lenses are concerned. In ICL, because they, especially the toric version of these lenses, they come in a particular power, so the manufacturer tells you where exactly to leave these lenses behind. But in the IPCL, all these lenses are custom made so that you can leave these lenses at exactly 0, 180 degrees. That's obviously a bit of an advantage. As a sizing of the holes in the ICL, it's all 360 micron holes, and it has been specifically determined that when you have 360 microns, that allows good communication between the anterior and the posterior chamber, but at the same time, there's no gush of fluid that's coming in. In the IPCL, it's a slightly larger 400 micron holes, and the most important thing is, as far as the uh, indication is concerned, what you have, the mark over here is in the leading right ha uh, haptic, 
and the trailing left haptic. In a case of uh, IPCL, you have this small collar stud over here, which is in the leading left haptic and, uh, at, uh, and in the trailing right haptic. The reason I'm emphasizing this is you might be quite conversing with ICL. When you switch over to these Indian lenses, you have to understand the positioning indications are slightly different because one of my colleagues actually ended up implanting in the wrong direction simply because he expected that the indication would be in the leading right haptic, which is not the case. And uh, the ICLs are dispensed in balance all solutions, so there's no enlargement or power change that occurs after implantation, while IPCL is in saline. So the actual wall, the power, comes in in the next 24 to 48 hours. The loading, as we already discussed, is somewhat different. It has to be specifically learnt in the case of ICL, while in IPCL it's very similar to plate haptic lenses, and once you have used some of them, it's easy to adapt. And this is as far as the optic sizing is concerned. One good thing about the IPCL is when you have extremely large IPC, uh, mesopic pupillary size, you can custom make these lenses to even an optic size of 6.5, 6.8, etc., without really compromising the overall diameter of the lenses. And I believe that's an advantage when you come to some of these young myopes. As I already alluded to, when you have these six haptics in the case of an IPCL, that is supposed to uh, enhance the kind of stability that we have with these lenses. This is just to show you the IPCL and a uh, uh, direct microscope. You can see over there the central hole, the paraoptic holes, the small uh, holes that are there in the, the fairly large holes that are there in the haptics. It is said that that is, helps us in case there is oversizing of these lenses by getting compressed, it ensures that there's adequate vaulting. I'm not personally totally convinced about this. So extremely important that you get the right sizing of these lenses. And uh, as far as the implantation of these lenses is concerned, I would like you to concentrate both ICLs and IPCL. This is the way I do it. I do not dilate these pupils before surgery simply because I want the iris protection on the lens so that there's no lens touch uh, because of the instruments that I use to create the incision. If the side port that is used, I just usually do, uh, inject a little bit of saline to make the globe tense. Then it's the uh, main port of uh, three millimeters that's made. Then subsequently, I uh, use a mixture of adrenaline and xylocaine. And as you can see in these high myopic cases, the pupils dilate very well. And what essentially goes in in this is a high molecular weight co coercive viscoelastic. And that's the fake and talk lens that being injected into the eye. There's actually real-time video. It's hardly edited. There's all the time it takes. There's no uh, dilatation that is done, no injection, no irrigation aspiration that's done. And subsequently, I'm just uh, positioning these uh, haptics of the lens behind the pupillary margin. And it's extremely important that to the extent possible, you do not touch the central optic region, which is quite thin. And so all I do is to go ahead and um, hydrate my ports. And this alone, just because it's a cohesive viscoelastic, as you can see, it just flows out in a bolus. Initially, it was thought that you should not be using cohesive viscoelastic, but now with the centra hole, you can see there's no irrigation aspiration that I'm using, no dilatation, and all I've done is to just uh, hydrate my poles, and once the bolus of viscoelastic stops flowing out, I know that it's complete evacuation that has happened, and that's the end of surgery. There's another way of implanting that I'm not showing you, just the conventional way. Another way of implanting the lens is to use a, do a hydro implantation because one of the most important things is to not behave, not uh, leave behind any dispersive viscoelastic in the eye or HPMC in the eye. And in case you have not used any HPMC at all, there's no question of doing complete evacuation. In this case, again, it's no dilatation, but I am just uh, dilating once I have made the incisions. I like the uh, pure, uh, iris covering the lens so that there's uh, any remote chance of eye, uh, lens touch by the instruments while I'm making incisions is not there. And these uh, young uh, individuals the pupils dilate very easily and very well. And you can see that's the irrigation cannula which is inside. I raise my IOP to 90 so that I get a fairly deep anterior chamber at the time of introduction of the uh, lens. And that's the lens being injected into the anterior chamber. A very controlled uh, injection and uh, you make sure that the collar stud that is there in the, is in the left hand, the left leading corner. And then just I position the lens and subsequently I go ahead and uh, uh, position the lens behind the pupillary margin. Since no viscoelastic has been used, uh, then there is no need for any uh, evacuation of the viscoelastic. I find that this surgery really takes me just about three to four minutes to perform. And I do it bilaterally in both the eyes at the same time, provided the first eye surgery has gone well. Of course, even if it's a toric intraoc lens, I have the baryon overlay, and then I go ahead and uh, uh, implant it. To answer your question, uh, we do have started using the presbyopic uh, fakic IOLs. I think the EDOF ICLs is still awaited. 
the trifocal diffractive lenses are available right from plus 6 to minus 10 diopters basic power is basically 1.5 diopters to 3.5 diopters is at the lens plane so basically when you implant a plus 3 diopter lens all you get is about 2.1 diopters for near and about 1.2 diopters for intermediate sometimes i do a bit of a mix and matching of these lenses in the sense that if the patient is about 45 or 47 i uh, do a plus 2.5 in the first eye and do a plus 3 diopter in the second eye but usually I find that it is counterproductive to implant anything less than 2.5 doctors because it does not give uh, adequate near vision. This is just a, this is just a video of a, a presbyopic IPCL being implanted. Uh, most of the other steps have been done away with. You can see the viscoelastic just move going out. The most important is the last uh, bit of this uh, video where you can see, you'll see the diffractive rings on the, uh, that's the diffractive rings on the uh, IPCL. And I, I find that this works quite well, and especially those uh, patients in the 40s and 50s who, are, who have no cataract but looking for a refractive surgical correction, this is a good option that you can offer. Uh, once you have an um, improper positioning of these lenses, ideally these lenses should be in 0, 180 degrees. All I do is to uh, not to inject any viscoelastic again, just have an irrigation port inside the anterior chamber, go through the other side port, and then position it in such a way that uh, there's exact orientation of these lenses restored. Basically, the uh, rotation of these lenses will help only if the residual refractive error, the spherical equivalent, is almost zero. That is, if you have a minus one diopter with plus two diopters as cylinder, then the rotation of these lenses will help. But if it's just a minus 1.5 diopter of sphere or one diopter of cylinder that's left over, rotation is not going to help simply because when you rotate these lenses, you are just redistributing the power. You're not ad adding or subtracting any power. So this is a simple concept that you have to understand. So if a patient just had a minus one diopter of cylinder left over after I have implanted the lens, then I would go ahead and uh, do a laser vision correction on the eye. But if it's a significantly large power that's left over, then it would be an exchange of lens that is needed. Just, uh, I would just like to briefly allude to the very important aspect of IPCL sizing, which again, Purendra had, uh, covered quite adequately. It's not just white to white that is important. The AC depth as well as the average K is extremely important. Whether it's less than three millimeters or three to 3.5 millimeters or above 3.5 millimeters, makes a difference of almost one step as far as the sizing of these lenses are concerned. White to white usually corresponds to angle to angle, but as already mentioned, though it's intuitive to think that sulcus to sulcus would be the right way to go because that's where these lenses finally rest. That's not uh, usually what we use simply because it has not been well documented or well established by any companies to use this. IPCL sizing comes in usually in these patterns, usually is about one to 1.2 millimeters more. Just to uh, dwell upon this topic a little more because it's not just the power, but the sizing is the thing which gives you most uh, uh, problems, at especially in initial cases. As you can see over here, the first eye, everything was perfect, but I got a um, uh, vault of just about 130 microns. As you can see in a uh, anterior segment OCT, in the fellow eye is just about 80 microns. Mind you, uh, ideally it is said that if it is less than 100, 500 microns or 250 microns is the way to go. But Mark Packer has shown in a significant study that if the uh, lens remains quite uh, clear, and if even if it's 100 microns, you can observe these lenses. I have quite a few cases of both ICL as well as Indian lenses where the vault has been a little less, but then I have not exchanged these lenses, but observed them over a period of years. So just because the vault is less, you do not have to go ahead and exchange these lenses. Coming to the other end of the spectrum, this is one of my cases where you see that the vault is almost 1,136 microns in uh, one eye, and in the other eye, it's even higher, about 1,165 microns. And you can see even in the slit lamp photograph, it's a very significant vault. As far as the uh, angle is not zippering up and the uh, tension is well under control, gonioscopy shows that the angle is quite open, then uh, you can again observe these eyes. But sometimes when it goes beyond 1,000 microns, I go ahead and remove these, uh, exchange these lenses. As you can see over here, everything went right. It's not, the, that's the reason I believe that we still have not understood sizing accurately. This is the digital and optical which almost tallied about 1.2 millimeters more, the IPCL sizing that was right. Even in the second day, it was ex exactly right in the sense we had done all uh, right things, but then the vault was excessive. And that's the reason I go ahead and exchange this lens. 
whenever it's beyond one millimeter and there's a tendency in this case there was a tendency for the angle to zip up it was a shallow angle every time you put in a fake intraoc lens the angle shallows by about 15 degrees that's something you need to remember and in this excessive vaulting is not a good idea so basically what we did was to undersize this lens by about 0.25 millimeters if it was an icl i would have undersized by 0.5 millimeters of course you don't want to make it too small because especially if it's a toric lens because then there will be a greater tendency for the lens to rotate that was the icl coming out and this is the ipcl coming out and a toric ipcl exactly of the same power but of a lesser size that's going in uh, these are a couple of studies we have published this is in clinical ophthalmology basically what it showed uh, this was a first study with the ipcl 134 eyes and the conclusion was the ipcl is a safe and effective treatment modality for correction of myopia and myopic astigmatism for lack of time, I'm not going into details. This was a direct comparison of uh, 203 eyes of ICL, 119 eyes of IPCL. The consecutive eyes which was done at the same time, published in IGO, which shows that both the groups uh, demonstrated similar efficacy and safety profile. And uh, uh, basically, just my final thoughts, implantation of the Indian fake egg intraoc lens is a safe and effective procedure for refractive correction, myopia, hypropia, and astigmatism plus procedure today and in stabilized uh, well-centered keratoconus patients. Ideally, ICL is the front runner and I definitely if the patient can afford it, I would go for that. But just because uh, there's a cost consequences, I would not like to deny the uh, uh, benefits of these technologies to those patients. And in that case, I do not uh, hesitate to go ahead and adapt the Indian fake and talk lenses. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Ramamurthy. Any questions? Uh, well, I have used the biotech lenses also. They are also quite good. And the only thing is they do not always come with the orientation of 0, 180 degrees. In the sense they come at uh, 30 degrees, 150 degrees. So slight rotation of these lenses is necessary. Otherwise, those lenses are also hydrophilic acrylic lenses. And they also quite, they are called the acryl lenses. And they also work quite well. And I have used a few of the Apasami lenses also. They are also quite uh, work well, though I can't say that with uh, absolute clarity in my, based on my experience, simply be because my experience has been more with the IPCL. But uh, I think uh, you do nothing wrong by taking up the biotech lenses also. Any other question? Uh, what, a lady behind this. Class. If you can go to the mic so that everyone can so hear Thank you. you very much for the wonderful talk. I would just like to ask if the vault is high, uh, the uh, gonioscopy shows angles which are uh, closed uh, on primary uh, position of the gonioscopic lens, but on indentation it is opening up. But the IOP is absolutely normal. Would you uh, remove the lens? Uh, you know, this is a question I have, uh, I often discuss with my uh, glaucoma colleagues also. And they are very concerned about the angles closing up and narrowing down. That is the reason, apart from other tests, we also do a gonioscopy in all these patients. Yes. Unless the angle is beyond 30 degrees, we might be even reluctant to put in a fake and talk lenses in these eyes. Absolutely. If the angle is extremely shallow and the AC depth is also shallow, if the vault is something beyond 1000 microns, I'll go ahead and uh, exchange the lens. But if the pressure is under control, the angle is about 15 degrees and uh, the vault is just about 750, 800 microns, I'll uh, uh, go ahead and observe these eyes. It has even been recommended this sometimes you, just for your sake, you do a peripheral idotomy in these cases. I do not think that has any role at all because you already have a central hole and that's not going to enhance the kind of uh, wall that you're going to get. Right. Uh, one you. thing uh, is there, I think uh, in all these uh, cases, even if the vault is high, um, we don't get a occlusion of the angle. What you are saying is a hypothetical question. No, no, and I practically, am. Uh, what we we I, I have also come across with uh, cases of a uh, uh, thousand uh, micron vault and more than that but uh, angle occlusion is not there because of the sh sh uh, the shape of the lens the that's why it doesn't pushes right at the angle you know it, it's not hypothetical actually in fact i have a patient with 1200 uh, but uh, the gonioscopy on primary gaze is closed on indentation it opens but the iop is normal so oh, in I this I situation uh, I IOP is under control? Under control. <laughs> I'd also like you to look at the pigmentation of the angle. Yes. You know, sometimes there's a lot of pigments and then, you know, the, uh, mm. then that's again a uh, reason for you to remove the lens. Obviously, these cases, what we do is to put them on regular follow-up on three monthly intervals. And if we find that the angles are getting progressively narrowed, then go ahead and don't allow, don't uh, 
uh, uh, try Thank your luck you to move along and just go ahead and explain these lenses. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any experience? Sir, I had uh, one question. Since uh, you are doing hyperopic as well as presbyopic, uh, in this case especially the uh, ACD is on the uh, lower side, not exactly very. Uh, but then, uh, do you consider uh, the issue of lens rise over a period of years? No. Uh, one thing is there. You know, I for me, 2.8 millimeters is the AC depth from the corneal endothelium. Even in the hyperopic, presbyopic lenses, all these lenses, I uh, keep this in consideration. But one important thing is the uh, myopic lenses are all plano concave, mm -hmm. while the hyperopic lenses are biconvex. So, so the thickness of these lenses is somewhat more in the center as well as in the periphery, because of which you have to be even more specific about the anterior chamber depth. Otherwise, I mean, my criteria for implanting these lenses is the same. But the and issue the of uh, lens rise? Lens uh, rise, uh, yes. Uh, that was a matter of concern. It is said that it increases by about 0.1 millimeter for every decade of the lifetime of the patient. But because uh, it has been found that these lenses, since they are positioning the sulcus, they're not really resting on the lens. And now we have follow-up of ICL patients over a period of 20, 30 years, two, three decades, because the lenses were implanted way back in 1988, right from that time. Now with the central hole also, that seems to be a less of a concern. And I myself have been implanting these lenses for almost 20 years now. And we find that it's not really, uh, the, uh, the uh, anterior chamber is not getting progressively narrowed down. Thank you. Sir. With the positive of time, we will take the last question. Okay. And then we will add, uh, you can have this, your question. Yeah. Sir, what is the most common factor that is responsible for post-op cataract uh, in IPCL? And how can we avoid it? Uh, what extra precaution that we can take? I think sizing is the most important reason. You know, there are... There vault are, and sizing. One is if the vault is too low and it's sitting on the uh, surface of the lens, then obviously cataract can occur. The other factor is uh, uh, what the, the surgical maneuvers. In case, especially it's been said that irrigation aspiration, it's not the implantation of the lens, but during irrigation aspiration, any lens stage can cause. And another very important paper that came out from uh, uh, Roberto Zaldiva years back was that patients who are more than 40 years of age, and when you ex implant uh, lenses of power, more than 15 doctors, these are the patients who have okay. a greater tendency for uh, uh, getting a cataract compared to lower myopes and uh, uh, what patients who are of a lesser age group. So this is of course because when you once you go on to the four, fifth, and sixth decade, these are patients who are already predisposed to cataract. But if it's just nuclear sclerosis, is not the lens which is responsible. For you to say it's because of the lens, it has to be an anterior subcapsular. Anterior cataract. subcapsular. If you are getting cataract in uh, younger patient in after three or four years of age, the of uh, time follow up. So what must be uh, the you have no other choice but to go ahead and remove the lens and do a clear lens extraction. And what must be the reason behind that? that could be senile or could be anything? No, one uh, other or due to patients. the low vault, due okay. to the lens itself. I think one important factor could be a <coughs> lens touch while doing this surgery. Right. Sometimes you touch it with the spatula okay. and then you get a. You know, so that so is a very important factor, the surgery itself. And that was more common when the, before the center of flow came in. Now with the central hole, we are finding that the incidence of cataract, once the initial period is quiescent, does not really happen. Uh, not that it never happens, but the incidence is much less. May I request uh, our next speaker, Dr. Sudhank Bharti. Um, he is uh, from Bharti Eye Institute, Delhi. And uh, he will be talking on managing complications and pearls to avoid the fake in fake uh, lenses. And uh, he is a phenomenal surgeon and uh, excellent refractive surgeon with a long history of uh, doing refractive procedure for last, I think, 30, 35 years. And he has got an enormous experience of using these lenses also. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Purendra, for giving me this opportunity to be here in the instruction course. And uh, uh, Regarding the development of cataract, one other issue was, uh, which was uh, which has been stated is because of the fl uh, the flow of aqueous from behind the lens to the anterior chamber in the anterior chamber was obstructed b b by this ICL. So there was uh, so this was one factor stated uh, in the past, and but because of this newer 
Vijayan IUL, uh, the, with the center of flow design, this has been taken care of and uh, the chances of development of cataract are now minimized. So flow of aqueous is better now. Uh, please welcome Dr. Partha, please come. Take photograph with uh, Dr. Patra and uh, our speaker here. <coughs> welcome. I welcome Dr. Partha Biswas, uh, although he is, uh, uh, is uh, your slide ready, sir, Dr. Bharti? No, I mean your presentation is not. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it on this side. Can you? Uh. Uh, this is uh, something which is a transient phenomenon. What I tell the patient, like in this hall, in front of me, this microscope is there. So many other persons are sitting in front of me, but I am focusing at you. You are also focusing at me, otherwise so many things. So you just have to neglect and avoid that. And immediately p these young patients are very, very intelligent, so they forget it, and then after that they don't complain. Your, your reply. No, I mean, it's halos, like always, you know, either the halos go away or the patient goes away. That happens everywhere. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but all said and done, this is a definite problem for the simple reason, you know, especially these young myopes, uh, the pupil d tends to dilate quite a lot. And you have lenses of just about 5.16 millimeter optics. That's the reason when I, we check the mesopic pupillary size in all these cases. If you find the music pu mesopic pupil is very large, then we go ahead and custom make a slightly larger optic lens. So whenever the pupil dilates, especially in uh, mesopic conditions, beyond the edge of the pupil, then uh, edge of the optic of the lens, then the patient starts uh, experiencing halos. So essentially I tell them not to look for it. You know, uh, often they start look, uh, searching for the halos because they've seen it. I say, you ignore it, your brain will adapt to it. I Most often it get, they get convinced, but otherwise using alpha gun, using uh, pilocarpin, we'll avoid pilocarpin because many, now, many of these patients are high myopes. Uh, but uh, the usual ways you do with multifocal lenses is the way you handle it. It's there. And there are some patients who persistently complain. But that number is very less. Yeah. And uh, with in Indian eyes, our pupil size is also not large. So, so now Evo Plus, yeah. uh, Ramamurthy, Evo Plus is 7 millimeter pupil. It covers 7 millimeter of pupil. Uh, six so it doesn't matter. Ah, 6, 7.1. The corneal plane. The Evo Plus okay. goes up to 7 millimeter. So, so it mostly. We cannot blame the size of the pupil. Sir, you we'll have to come to the top I'll, because I'll uh, three presentations are left and <laughs> we are short of time. Okay. So my talk is on managing complications in pearls to avoid complications in the sir, 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 ICL. Yes. And this is how we mark uh, the axis. Simply, I don't know, it works. Yeah, so simply what happens is that you can may not use all your fancy devices and expensive uh, techniques for uh, one, 0, 180 markings. You can just mark it with a pencil and can use the uh, <coughs> IO, uh, this mo mobile for marking these and you can just mark as to what kind of access, wrong access you have already marked and take your 0 to 180 and then go forward and start putting the ICL. This is a simple um, ICL surgery for a routine um, practitioner, what I am trying to show here, just to show that access marking is important. And I'll come back to certain other things. This is a two minute video, we have marked the access. And then a couple of tips for uh, the surgery. The first thing is when you do a side port don't go beyond the margin of the iris even if uh, when you have dilated pupil. Like Ramamurthy, you can use a dilation later on, but here I have dilated the pupil and then I put xylocaine, uh, intracameral 1% and uh, once you put a xylocaine, then the surgery becomes absolutely painless for the, uh, the patient. Then I put a viscoelastic which is a normal HPMC or whatever you are getting because it's easier and easier to wash and can be you know washed from the behind the ICL very comfortably. And then I make the main port. This is another uh, thing which I do and this is I make the main port 
later after I have inflated the anti chamber so that and follow the corneal curvature. So, this, with this, it is not possible to damage the ICL. Now, another thing which I want to tell everyone is that I put a little bit of viscoelastic on the mouth of the <coughs> uh, vial and then once you have taken the ICL out, you are taking out the ICL and then you can see that it sticks to the sponge. Even if you turn it around, it will not fall. So these are a couple of things which I have you know, learned over a period of 20, 22, 23 years of doing my ICLs. And then rest of the things are very uh, routine. You put uh, it um, like this though in my, and another thing where I want to emphasize another uh, thing is that you pull the, uh, don't pull the ICL, just pull the cartridge away. So don't pull the ICL into the snout, pull the cartridge away and then it is not very difficult. Only once you will fail in uh, and may put a ICL upside down and on the reverse side and that can cause a lot of glaucoma and eye pressure. So that's another factor where you are and then uh, the rest of the thing is as routine. Every one of you is doing that. It's not difficult. Just make sure that you don't touch the center of the ICL while uh, you know rotating or making it go behind. This is the time and I take out the viscoelast viscoelastic from behind the lens and then put the viscoelastic in front <coughs> so that the lens is sitting flat inside the AC and there is no viscoelastic as much of viscoelastic as possible is removed and then you can rotate it comfortably couple of times this is the time when you can injure the crystalline lens when you are you know pushing it and your spatula slips down so this is the time when you should be very very careful and then you can adjust the axis at the right point. These surgeries are all done under topical anesthesia and intracameral anesthesia. It's not only topical as I mean, you know. And then just at the end, I want to put the irrigation right at the hole in the central fenestration. And I do not press the posterior lip. I rather lift the upper lip. If you push the posterior lip, there is always a possibility that your eyes can come out. If you do not push the posterior lip, it will not come out, it will remain like this. You just have to lift the lip. These are a couple of things which I thought maybe I will show you just because. So now complications are increased IOP and uh, subsequently glaucoma increased IOP temporarily could be because of sizing and you know glaucoma as uh, the lady asked earlier it could be because of uh, you know factors which are unknown to us b before or we have not investigated properly like the synechia and peripheral things so that for that gonioscopy and other things are very important but increased IOP is a wall tissue and proper vault is very important and for that sizing of the IOL is, ICL is very very important so other things are possible, other things are under correction or over correction, which is of course your uh, you know in examination things which are possible. It's very rare that you have done a ref refraction more than a couple of times and then your ICL will wrong, go wrong. And wrong axis and ICL rotation is also because of sizing issues and we have discussed sizing in the other talks. But uh, sizing is very very important and uh, we must take into consideration the AC depth because something like <coughs> the ICL will not be same for for a AC depth of 2.8 or 3.0 or 3.4 in higher myopias the AC depth is much higher and then the ICL sizing will be accordingly adjusted and also we have to imagine that we are putting the ICL in this sulcus to sulcus and not uh, you know white to white is slightly uh, 
thing. The other thing is that uh, cloudy cornea or detachment or infection. These are uh, the surgical complications as in other surgeries. So this is uh, the thing while you're not you're doing the surgery, you have to be very careful that you do not damage the endothelium. We've already investigated that there is nothing. Uh, you know, uh, no disease uh, related to corneal endothelium before that and retinal attachment and everything. You have to properly investigate the patient, do all the kind of investigation which you want to do for uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy and uh, lasers. I always do even if there is a little bit of uh, uh, small hole or a lattice degeneration in a high myope. I, even in these cases, I want to do a lattice also. I want to treat and infection is of course the thing which is you know uh, surgical thing which is very important uh, the halos glare and double vision as we were discussing earlier it is um, majority of times we have found that it is because of the central fenestration and this central fenestration is you know if it is there then you have to only counsel the patient nothing else works you have to counsel again and again and maybe you know the patient understands but uh, it's it's something which yeah, as ramavarti said either the uh, glare goes or the patient goes they will stay together for always you know it it, it doesn't happen now uh, sizing a couple of things about sizing white to white at 180 uh, uh, the, the two ways which I want to measure them is pentacam and caliper and I do it uh, with the caliper I want to do it in the operation theatre with the <coughs> anesthesia and patient lying down and then 180 marking I've already done before so with the caliper 180 in the OT is the best way to measure because when the patient is sitting sometimes you are the patient is moving and then you're struggling and then sometimes it is better to let the patient lie down peacefully and then do the uh, caliper marking it is the other thing which is important it is white to white and not black to black so that white to white marking is beyond black to black so this is another thing which is very important for ultimate sizing or correct sizing of the ICL. So that is why I do a pentacam and a caliper and sometimes I find that uh, the, but with my experience and not only me with my staff's experience because we have been doing this for the last 20, 25 years. Um, it is it is uh, white to white manually seems to be a wonderful bet though I do it with the pentacam as well. The other complications are additional surgery for a low vault patient, a cataract, high vault, a glaucoma and rotation for toric, toric ICL where it has rotated. In majority of patients where the toric ICL rotated, you have to consider doing, uh, you know, replacing it with another ICL because in a normal circumstance, unless it is, uh, you know, uh, it is, has to be a undersized ICL before you go forward and uh, you know, it will rotate only if there is undersizing of the ICL. Uh, other thing is, uh, a couple of things are there which are, you know, you, they are beyond your control like hemorrhage, inflammation, iridotomy complications when the iridotomy becomes larger in earlier cases and uh, in all those hyperopic cases where you have to do iridotomy in these cases. And I do not do I differ from other surgeons. I do not do a hyperopic ICL unless the AC depth is 3 millimeter and not 2.8. So for me, uh, AC depth of uh, 3 millimeter is uh, the basic thing for uh, for the hyperopic I ICL. And uh, this toric ICL, I am just showing it because of the reason that this fenestration is a very important factor. And sometimes this is the biggest culprit in causing all kind of halos. Uh, thank you, Purendra, for allowing me, and thank you, the audience, for for listening peacefully for such a long time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Bharti. Just one question: uh, Your choice of implantation is uh, either hydro implantation or with visco, and what visco you use? I, I <coughs> use the most convenient, you know, methyl cellulose which is available in the Indian market. I don't use all that fancy viscose. Uh, and um, hy no hydro uh, uh, No hydro, hydro implantation. Of course, okay. no hydro implantation. And I you, don't. You, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Sri Ganesh. Uh, masters, can you say?
at one yeah. percent because uh, we did a study also uh, with the V4C you have a central hole the center flow where through which you can evacuate the viscoelastic previously they were not suggesting sodium hydronate because it you were not able to evacuate it it used to form a putty in the center and then it used to affect the nutrition to the lens right. so now because of the central hole you can very easily evacuate it with high uh, flow and vacuum so uh, what we found was the incidence of uh, iop spikes post op and uh, the duration for removing the viscoelastic also was much shorter so that's why we have we use uh, sodium ionide yeah. yeah. studies published thank you also. and uh, dr shri ganesh he requires no introduction he is uh, one of the finest and brilliant surgeon of the country and in the world and in asia and uh, i should say and um, he will be sharing his experiences in challenging cases and some complications uh, which he has managed uh, with related to the uh, fake lens i welcome you dr shri ganesh thank, for this thank thank you for thank you this. and uh, good afternoon dear friends uh, uh, i would like to thank dr purinder for inviting me for his course on uh, fake iuls and uh, i would like to show you some cases rather than go through the list of complications show you some cases some videos so it's kind of video based not my fault <laughs> and uh, no, i was <laughs> dear gentlemen so this is let us look at some of the ch challenging cases this was a patient to uh, 21 year old female you can see that uh, high refractive error minus 9 with a small cylinder and uh, we used a uh, Uh, V4C, uh, uh, right eye minus 10.5, left eye minus 11, um, 13.2 mm overall diameter, uh, and uh, uneventful uh, ICL surgery post-op day five. She came for routine uh, follow-up, and when we when I looked at it, it was uh, the vaults were quite high clinically, so we measured it on ASO CT. We found the vault in the right eye to be uh, 1.29 millimeters, uh, almost 1,300 microns. And left eye thousand to forty microns. Um, so this is um, you can see that's the AC OSO CT right eye, thousand uh, almost thousand three hundred uh, volt, and uh, the angles were narrow, very high volt, uh, and the other eye. So this is uh, not acceptable. Acceptable. So what will you do in this case? So you have a very high volt. Patient is happy. She has got good vision. Patient is happy, but the volt is very high. and the, you can see that the peripheral angle is narrow so if you leave it like that over a period of time as the pupil dilates and all that it's going to uh, cause an angle uh, closure chronic angle closure you may develop some sinusoidal cavity there um, so you have to deal with it so you have to tell the patient that look um, this is what has happened so what are the options i mean how will you manage it there are two approaches to this one is uh, you could exchange the lens for a smaller diameter the second approach is to rotate the lens which i did because this if you had noticed is not a toric it's a spherical uh, standard icl and as all of you all know the horizontal white to white is larger than the vertical white to white and that's what you take for measurement of the icl but if you look at the sulcus it is the opposite the vertical um, sulcus is much bigger than the horizontal sulcus so you have placed it horizontally and if you kind of rotate it then you can reduce the volt and this is what i planned on doing so i i took up the patient uh, again to the or and uh, you can open up the incision very easily you can see i open it up and i just put uh, intracameral and then i have my own uh, icl manipulator it is uh, a cannula which is sandblasted so you can inject either bss or uh, viscoelastic through it so you don't have to put viscoelastic you just kind of rotate it um, very gently into the uh, vertical position from the horizontal position you maintain the ac by just injecting bss so you don't have to put viscoelastic again again iop spike you, you may not be able to clear it so you just rotate it from the horizontal to the vertical it takes a, a less than a minute and uh, then you can you can see that's the position final position and then you can close the wound i just wash it gently and then close the wound and then uh, the other eye also similarly uh, we took up and uh, then you can open the incision very easily you can see it is in the horizontal position so i just go in with the cannula this is a cannula which i use i don't make any side ports 
so with this cannula it has a gentle curve so you can tuck in the haptics uh, it's sandblasted and you can uh, on the under surface and you can maintain the uh, chamber by injecting either BSS or uh, even for routine ICL uh, you can inject helon through this cannula sellable with epsilon so you can just rotate it and bring it into the horizontal position and uh, I mean into the vertical position so here I have used a little bit of viscoelastic and you can see this is the post-op vault it reduces from 1300 microns to 782 microns which is acceptable around 800 microns is, is fine and then the other eye was 857 microns. So this is a simple trick which you can do for a spherical um, ICL. You need not actually explant. Uh, you just have to rotate it. It's less traumatic. You get a lower vault and uh, the patient is fine. So this is something that you can do. If it's a toric, then of course you have to exchange it. This was uh, a case where I was injecting the lens and you can see that the lens actually flips. Sometimes this can happen. Again, the reason why this happens is uh, again, improper loading. If you don't load it, when you load it, you'll have to see that all the three holes are aligned on top. So here it has flipped. So what you can do if it has not flipped completely, again, it is a little tricky. It needs a little more skill. I inject a helon through the side port and then uh, deepen the AC and then I'm able to just rotate it and I'm, I'm able to flip it. I put, put in more helon, deepen the AC and then uh, you can just flip the lens. You can use the um, center of flow to grip the lens. So what I'm doing again with the cannula, hold the uh, center flow port and that kind of gives you a leverage to flip it. Okay, but for beginners again this is not ideal because you can endo, uh, damage the endothelium so endothelium so i will show you yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I will just forward this and then i tuck it in and then i will show you uh, the other case where actually uh, okay here you can see the lens has flipped and uh, now um, it's almost flipped completely, so here you can't really manipulate it. Otherwise, you can damage the lens, you can damage the endothelium, so you need to explant it. So I will show you the technique uh, which I use for explantation. I make a trapezoid incision. I don't extend the incision too much, but the internal lip, li lip I extend it so that I have a trapezoid incision. Then I go in and grab it at uh, the junction, hold the optic, and then with a twisting motion, I'm able to bring it out through the same incision. And then you reload it into the cartridge. And then you can inject it. So that is uh, something that you can do. The other uh, thing is when a patient develops a cataract, wants a femto cataract, these young patients read about it on the internet. If you use your uh, um, uh, femto laser for cataract surgery then while doing the scanning it takes the ICL anterior surface as the first surface uh, to do the capsulotomy so you need to manually reset uh, the gates there you can see I'm resetting it from the ICL surface to the anterior surface of the crystalline lens and you need to do this otherwise you will have your capsulotomy on the uh, fakic IUL and not on the um, capsule anterior surface of the capsule and then you can go ahead and then do your capsulotomy and uh, nucleotomy and uh, these lenses are quite soft so you can first you have to explant it again the technique of explantation through the 2.8 mm incision I twist it and rotate it after grabbing it at the optic haptic uh, junction and once you explant the ICL again don't extend the incision because again that will affect your fluidics while doing FACO and then you can go ahead with uh, removing the cataract it's quite soft and then inject a lens here it's the expand series because the patient had a very high myopia and you can successfully do it uh, thank you very much for your attention because there's one more speaker <coughs> um, yeah it was wonderful to have all these uh, various one good question. cases yeah uh, i have observed that uh, vertical orientation of the iol mm. in a press biopic whatever my you know multifocal trifocal edo 
the center of the pupil and the center of the lens is uh, more aligned when it is vertically implanted as compared to when you implant it horizontally, right? So that's a standard thing. See, that again depends uh, yeah. upon the angle Sorry, alpha. Sorry, but what I'm trying, angle kappa Six and everything Not angle, except angle except alpha. I'm, okay, uh, let me I'm just talking explain it, yeah. about the uh, orientation with the pupil. Okay. Now, you think it will be the same with the ICL if you think that the ICL can be implanted vertically in all those cases where you want to implant. Uh, you have to do a study because you can do that as to what <laughs> I can explain what will be the what will be the size for vertical implantation of this. We can discuss it yeah. uh, after this. This uh, is just a thought and I may not be able to get. If you want, I can give a quick time. explanation. See, the thing is, the uh, angle alpha is usually in the horizontal direction, which is the <laughs> distance between the optical <laughs> axis and the sorry. visual axis. Oops, sorry, we'll okay, discuss, we'll discuss this we'll later. Discuss later. later. The so chairman scientific committee. No, who is more important than the chairman <coughs> scientific committee? It is this young girl young who girl, raises yeah. up her placard. Yeah. She is the person who is going to discipline all of us. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Purendra. Excellent uh, 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 I see you've been conducting tough situations because Dr. Bharti has already shown uh, the normal situation. I'll just go over and show a few s situations which might be useful in everyday practice. Now look at this uh, situation in which, you know, the applicator and the ICL have got stuck. So if such a thing happens, then you need to be very, very gentle. Why did it happen? Because I had not hydrated the applicator well. And when this happens, please don't pull it out because the ICL is thin and it is, uh, at times it can tear. So the most important thing is tweeze it out with the forceps. The next quick situation that I'm going to show, this again for uh, my young colleagues, do not place in an ICL in a mid-dilated pupil. This one was a mid-dilated pupil. It was not actually uh, dilating well. So I placed it in. And you see what uh, the trouble that I'm having it. It's a pretty old video, but I want to show you this iris popping out. You have to be extra gentle. The visco should not go under the iris. Otherwise, this can be a situation. If you have put in too much visco, if it goes under the iris, the pop-up of the iris is a very big possibility. And this traumatized iris is traumatized for life. So every time, even 20 years later, you're going to see that iris atrophy over there. So be very, very gentle, and uh, such a thing should not augur. Now look, the stuck ICL. Sri Ganesh showed a few situations of this. Here again, I'm stuck with the ICL. The jerk of a patient moving his or her head, and then if the slip off of the applicator comes on, then this is a situation that you might have. Be very gentle, be very judicious. You must know which side is upside, and it should not go upside down. So a uh, very judicious way of uh, supporting it and uh, gradually shoving it in so that it opens the right side up. Another quick situation, rotation of ICL, I think Sri Ganesh has already shown. Now, this is, um, uh, this is a situation that I'm, uh, I'm going to show you. And this is a patient who had an ICL, got back 6, 9 vision and 6 vision, was very, very happy. There were treated lesions in the retina. So the take-home point is any treatable lesions in the retina you must treat before you do refractive surgery. It was treated, everything was nicely treated, but this patient uh, developed retina detachment after six months and lost vision. Our retina colleagues took it up, did a very good job, settled the retina, patient came back with 618 and 10 vision, and but this is what happened three months later and in three months the patient lost vision because of a lens touch that had happened during this uh, I, during the retina detachment surgery and you have a tough situation removal of this icl is the first thing that has to be done you have to put in viscoelastic but remember you have to stay in the anterior capsule also after placing in the viscoelastic in these uh, videos, uh, somehow, you know, I cannot fast forward the video. But in any case, um, th the removal of the ICL is the first concern. The next concern would be, do re uh, mark that, you know, there was synechia on the lens, on the ICL. 
this patient's uh, the uh, capsular excess has to be very very judicious and that is where uh, I'm going to face problems in the capsular excess now removal of the ICL has to be hand over hand and what Shriganesh showed very nicely the thickest portion of the ICL is that rim between the optic and the haptic so if you can grasp that you know it will come out without damaging neither the optic nor the haptic but the grasp is very important and these uh, forceps should be used for the grasp now when i do the uh, i'm staining uh, it of course removing the viscoelastic and i'm staining it but what is going to happen is my rexus is going to run out in this place so always in such cases you must have two things in mind you must have a single piece lens which you would like to place it in the bag but if such a situation occurs you must have a backup of three piece cases three piece lenses so once uh, the, uh, you can see that uh, this uh, it's a little bit of a tricky uh, rexus and it's going to run out i'm just saying the steps before it happens because you know <laughs> i'm sure the placard is going to come up very soon so uh, the other thing is if there has been a lens touch what would you think of a lens touch has occurred so what would you think of another complication that is bound to occur anybody quickly from the audience yeah the, there could be a PC dehiscence but more than that uh, nearly two months had elapsed before the uh, surgery took place so there was a plaque and that plaque was there and it's going to uh, I mean we'll be showing that plaque now that plaque has to be negotiated and there has to be a proper rexus posterior capsular axis but this is an anterior capsular uh, which has run out so a posterior capsular axis is ruled out so through the plaque and you can see the plaque now I'm going to puncture that plaque and with a vitrector here comes the role of a vitrector whereby you can carve out a small opening in the posterior capsule but you should not go beyond the edges of the plaque thank you very much we conclude the session Thank <laughs> you.